Okay, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the CC Animal Health CE presentations. Today is race approved. The subject matter is improving pain management and post-operative recovery with TPEMF. Our presenter today is Dr. Leilani Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is the Director of Integrative and Rehabilitative Medicine at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. She is a board certified diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehab and certified in veterinary acupuncture, canine rehab, and advanced Chinese herbal medicine. Dr. Alvarez graduated with honors from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine and completed her internship and residency at the Animal Medical Center. She has been practicing veterinary rehab and integrative medicine for over a decade and leads one of only five traditional residency programs in canine sports medicine and rehabilitation. In addition to running a busy rehab practice, Dr. Alvarez is a renowned national and international lecturer, research scientist, and accomplished author of peer-reviewed articles. She is the 2017 recipient of the, whoops, recipient of the John Sherman Award for Excellence in Veterinary Rehab. Her areas of expertise and research include joint supplements, geriatric rehabilitation, veterinary orthotics and prosthesis, and regenerative therapies. We welcome Dr. Alvarez. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, these are continue to be such unusual times. And uh, while I am an international lecturer, practically all of my international lectures have been canceled. So I'm always delighted to lecture. And uh, now I'm able to reach people around the world from my own home, or I'm at, I'm at my clinic right now. Um, my purpose in today, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see the slides here. Give me one second. Uh -huh. Okay, here we are. So everybody's seeing everything here. And then yes. let me just, oh, give me one second. Okay, perfect. All right. So the topic of today's lecture is improving pain management and postoperative recovery with targeted pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Um, my goal in the lecture today is really to lead you with some practical types of cases that you can improve. For example, this is a patient that I'm sure all of you see, a uh, patient that presents uh, with a disc herniation. This dog um, had no motor, as you can see. Uh, many of these patients, you know, might undergo a hemilaminectomy. This particular dog had advanced heart disease and they were not able to pursue surgery. So what can you do non-invasively to help their recovery? Or what about this patient that that had a TPLO and is completely non-weight bearing on that limb. Uh, arguably the main reason why he's not using the leg is not because of a complication with surgery, but it's pain. And so you know, how can you help that patient? Or this patient uh, who is a geriatric patient that actually had a limb amputation due to osteosarcoma, um, is in a lot of pain, hospitalized from pneumonia, what can you do to help that patient? So um, here's a summary of the things that I want you to take away from today, um, one of which is, is really just to make clear that while we're going to be talking a lot about using the ACC loop and pulse electromagnetic field therapy, I do consider this one of many other things that you can use in order to help patient recovery. So it's another important tool in your toolbox. We're going to be talking about how you can use this device for pain management because you can achieve pain management without drugs um, in the term that a CC, I love this term, an NPAID. So this is a non-pharmaceutical anti-inflammatory device. I'm going to be giving you a little bit of background and how uh, this technology actually works, so the mode of action. In addition, we're going to be giving you some specific examples, again, because I want this to be practical for you, and um, how you can apply it for improved recovery for wounds and bone healing, reduction of soft tissue swelling and edema, as well as pain management. And we're going to end by uh, discussing the current level of evidence, specifically with the ACC loop in the veterinary literature, uh, in particular a study that I conducted, uh, but there's actually a couple of studies that are out in the literature. So let's first 
understand what we're talking about when we're talking about these electromagnetic fields. So, you know, I always like to break things down into simple terms. And when you think about it, all atoms and cells produce an electromagnetic field. Uh, and this is important to realize because we have this energy and this electricity that is running through our bodies that dictates actually practically every reaction that's happening in our body um, has an electric current associated with it. In fact, every organ produces its own unique bioelectromagnetic field. Um, over 70 trillion cells in our body are communicating every day right now using these electromagnetic fields. So it's no surprise that if we have a device that can influence this electromagnetic field, that it could have a very impactful therapeutic uh, benefit. So the tissues in our bodies and in our patients are very sensitive to changes in this electromagnetic activity. And that is really the premise of how pulsed electromagnetic field therapy works because we are manipulating in a very, very minute way. It's actually at bioelectrical field frequencies that we are tapping into this energy that cells are using every day, every second to communicate with each other. So let's talk a little bit about the history of PMF because this is actually not novel. It might seem like it's novel. We've been hearing about using this devices fairly recently, but it's been around for over a century. Um, the uh, original devices were quite cumbersome and large. They almost looked like CT scans. Uh, but modern PMF technology was reborn in the 1930s. These are dia diathermy devices by which essentially, um, you know, you have radio frequency devices that are heating deep tissues. And then the diamethermy machine was adapted in order to remove that heating element, which now made it a much safer modality for patients. And really in the 1970s is where things really took off, where we actually now have some prospective clinical trials. Not surprisingly, um, the earlier trials were in dogs, which benefits us in the veterinary industry. Um, but the, the, one of the early uh, papers that was published in JAMA in 1982 um, was showing improvement in bone healing um, in these beagles that had fractures of their tibias and they saw improved bone healing uh, four weeks after having exposure of PMF to a non-union fracture. Um, and then we actually saw a you know, really important change after study that was published um, in the early 1980s, where it led to FDA approval of this device. And this involved a study with over a thousand patients that had ununited fractures uh, or failed arthrodesis. Um, this was actually through Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, where they saw a success rate of 81% um, using these low powered PMF devices, which at that time were, were called bone growth stimulators. And that's what led to the FDA approval of PMF devices. In the 1990s, um, we actually saw uh, a surgence, a resurgence really of the next generation of PMF devices because now um, instead of these still cumbersome bone growth stimulators, we now see more targeted devices which we can apply for reduction of soft tissue swelling, for example. And that's really what we are uh, using these days is these more targeted PMF devices. Now, as we begin to talk about these devices, and even though we do talk about FDA approval, uh, it's really important to realize that not all PMF devices are the same. So the technologies can differ quite widely in their waveform, um, so the pulse width, the pulse frequency that they deliver. Um, and again, even though many of these devices may be FDA clear, the FDA clearance is for the short wave non-thermal diathermy devices that emit a frequency of 27.12 megahertz. But even though they might 
have that frequency and therefore they have FDA clearance, you could have these various changes in uh, pulse width, pulse frequency, also the size and the and the, the actual geometry of the antenna of emission can be quite different between devices. The duration of the actual pulse that's delivered um, can be varied. And just as an example, um, and this is actually a really lovely publication by Jamie Gaynor, um, published in um, the Vet Science Journal in 2018, that really, you know, clarifies how widely different these PMF devices can be. So if you look at, for example, in a study where they used a non-targeted PMF device, again, we have the same frequency. You see the waveform is that 27.1 megahertz, um, but the pulse width is quite different. So in the non-targeted, it's a much wider width of um, 1,000 um, milliseconds here uh, and a hertz of 1000, uh, which, you know, it's like you must have a much higher frequency. And they delivered it actually 12 hours daily. So you would think that that would be very impactful. But when you compare that to a targeted PMF device, which is what the ACC loop is, it's only two microsecond pulse width. So it's essentially, you know, it's, it's really, it's a quick, uh, very small pulse width um, and actually much smaller um, frequency there. So the, it's just two hertz of the pulse frequency. And you all actually only deliver it for 15 minutes twice daily. But look at the wide difference that we see in the outcome measure of the visual um, analog scale pain score. The reduction in pain in the non-targeted device was only 25%. But you have a much greater reduction in pain with the targeted PMF at 38.4. And in fact, when you look at it, the electric field in the targeted device is seven times stronger in the targeted PMF device as compared to the non-targeted device. So really my main point here is realizing that even though there's a lot of devices out there on the market, you really need to look at the research behind the device and what the actual waveform is, the size and geometry of the antenna and the duration to know how e effective it's going to to be. So um, how is it that we have efficacy? What is the actual mode of action? Uh, well, we, we understand that physiologically, which is really lovely um, to know. I won't bore you with too much of the science, but it's basically because as we talked about, this really taps into an electromagnetic field that is present in all cells. And there's one particular reaction, which is the binding of calcium to calmodulin, which is very important in the inflammatory cascade, uh, which is a voltage dependent reaction. And so the PMF device has an effect on upregulating this voltage dependent reaction of calcium to calmodulin, which then leads to an increased production of constitutive nitrous oxide synthase. This is the good type of nitrous oxide, which basically leads to vasodilation. And that reaction happens almost immediately within seconds. And this calcium to calmodulin nitrous oxide um, and and uh, cyclic guanosine monophosphate reaction leads to an anti-inflammatory cascade. So that whole reaction of calcium calmodulin, nitrous oxide, and CGMP leads to a down regulation of your inflammatory cytokines, in particular interleukin-1 beta, which is really um, something that is very upregulated, particularly in osteoarthritis, but in many other inflammatory conditions. That then also decreases your inducible nitrous oxide synthase, which is the bad kind of nitrous oxide, um, increases your uh, fibroblast growth factor, and also increases angiogenesis and increase in VEGF, which is an important growth factor. Um, so all of this then leads to improved tissue de regeneration and remodeling, which is, of course, fantastic. And all of this happens within minutes. Um, so very non-invasive way to have a very meaningful effect on not just decreasing inflammation, but bringing more blood supply to the area and growth factors. In particular, when we're talking about wound healing, the targeted PMF device is going to, again, enhance our anti-inflammatory nitrous oxide signaling. It's going to reduce our pro-inflammatory cytokines and improve and bring to the area more growth factors. So. 
when we think about the research uh, backing up our use of PMF for wound healing, there's a lot of early research, particularly on the human side for breast reconstruction surgery. So what we see in these studies is a reduction in the wound exudate vol volume. Um, so this is how exudative the wound actually is. Um, and so you can see in the, in the plot here between the sham device and the active PMF device that we have uh, the reduction in the amount of discharge that's coming from those wounds. These are studies published in 2015, as well as almost a 500 time greater increase in blood vessels coming to the area, um, which these were some rat studies and you can see the really lovely um, neovascularization that takes place there. Um, and as well as a nice study that was published in 19, it's a, an old study, but a really nice study because it was a prospective blind clinical trial published in the American Journal of Veterinary Research. Um, so this was a study in dogs looking at wound epithelialization and the dogs that received the targeted PMF therapy had improved wound epithelialization. So, so quite a vast number of studies. I've just picked out a few of them here, um, but quite substantial evidence showing that PMF improves wound healing. Um, uh, the FDA statement of the approval for PMF devices, targeted PMF devices, actually states that's for the reduction of soft tissue swelling and edema anywhere in the body. And I just wanted to show you uh, an example of really drastic improvements that I've seen in some of my own patients um, in regard to reduction of soft tissue swelling and edema. Um, so this was a seven-year-old greyhound that presented to our interventional radiology service uh, for an aortic thrombus that led to paresis of the hind limbs and really, really massive um, ecchymosis, swelling, and edema. I mean, you can barely even see this dog's um, tarsal anatomy because of the severe edema. And you can see how uh, the ecumatic hemorrhages that we were seeing here. So the treatment that we did is basically four times a day, we did uh, PMF therapy um, to in conjunction with compressive non-thermal therapy. So usually we use this compression therapy with ice, um, but with thrombi, you don't want to really change the temperature like that because we're already having issues with circulation. So we really use this just for the compression. Um, but then you can see this is immediately following the therapy. You can see the drastic improvement. This is literally uh, what the patient looked like before. We did the 15-minute therapy with the PMF and compression. And then immediately afterwards, now you can actually begin to see um, the Achilles tendon here, um, the tarsus, and and you can begin to see the limb. Um, so it really dramatic, immediate improvement. Um, this is when the patient went home. We actually sent the device home with them. They continued QID treatments at home and the dog uh, resumed complete ambulation and all of that edema, swelling, uh, and ecchymosis went away. So a really lovely way, again, to provide non-invasive therapy with pretty immediate results. Here's another example. Um, this was a dog that presented for a hypersensitivity reaction to a rabies vaccine. So he had generalized um, edema and erythema throughout his body. You can see, I mean, just the rolls that formed from the severity of the edema. I mean, here's a close up of the paw. Um, so again, um, we did compression therapy and PMF therapy to all the limbs. And then again, you can see immediate improvement. I actually measured it um, and we were just close to almost a centimeter in reduction of the uh, swelling of the limb immediately post the um, treatment with the PMF and compression therapy. And then this is what the dog looked like. And just in case you forgot, this is what he looked like before. Um, and then this is what he looked like after. So again, um, we get a lot of requests now from both our critical care department and our internal medicine department when they have cases that have severe soft tissue swelling and edema because they're just like, this is a miracle. You know, it really is an immediate uh, change that you can see in regards to reducing soft tissue swelling and edema. 
Um, another major area that is backed by research is uh, in bone healing. So bone growth stimulators, we talked about, that was the earlier term that was used in the 1970s where we did see evidence for improvement in bone healing. Well, since then, we now have a higher level of evidence when we're actually doing systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So there's a very nice paper published in 2016. This is a human paper, um, but it's a meta-analysis that takes into account 15 randomized controlled clinical trials that looked at PMF in the treatment of uh, bone healing. And the conclusion from these uh, 15 papers is that there was a moderate level of evidence showing that patients treated with electrical stimulation as an adjunct uh, for um, non-healing uh, bone uh, bone fractures, um, that it resulted in less pain um, and reduced risk for uh, non-union in those fractures. Um, and then another study published um, in 2002, uh, which was actually a canine study, again, in beagles. This was an experimental study where they actually induced an experimental uh, fracture in the mid-tibia, and they noted that uh, with the PMF treatment, there was an improved recovery of load bearing, so increased peak vertical forces, uh, increased new bone formation, as well as mechanical strength at the actual osteotomy site. So again, nice mixture of both veterinary and human research uh, backing up the efficacy of PMF for the improvement of bone healing. In addition to that, PMF um, has can have substantial benefits for reducing pain. This goes back to some of those breast reconstruction um, papers that we talked about for wound healing, well, they had also looked at the visual analog scale uh, in pain scores. And we see that the patients, these breast reconstruction patients that received PMF had a threefold faster um, decrease in their pain compared to the patients that received the sham device. Um, in addition, they actually measured these inflammatory cytokines. So again, going back to that, that really noxious inflammatory cytokine of interleukin-1 beta, uh, was reduced locally at the wound site by 40%, which then, of course, that cytokine then leads to um, pain signals being sent to the brain. Um, and then most importantly, um, this is going to be in interesting when we talk about the results of the study that I conducted here at the Animal Medical Center, um, but in these, again, these breast reconstruction patients, they demonstrated that the patients that received the active PMF device, they were able to reduce their narcotic use by um, up to 50% compared to the sham device. So that's very meaningful. If you can reduce opioid use um, by almost twofold, um, that that has a major impact, particularly in the human population where there's, a, you know, there's an epidemic of opioid overuse. Um, so remember that number because it was very interesting. We saw a very similar finding in the in the veterinary study that we conducted here. Um, so moving on into that evidence. Let's talk and shift a little bit to talking about just the veterinary evidence. Um, and one of the first areas that really made me a believer in using this technology was in my uh, post-op hemilaminectomy patients or actually also in patients who were uh, experiencing uh, disc disease and clients that didn't want to pursue surgery. Um, this PMF device, uh, I saw really dramatic improvements in this population. Um, and so as we know, intervertebral disc disease is one of the most common, in fact, it is the most common type of spinal cord injury in dogs. Um, and, and the reason why it's such an important disease is because when this disc extrusion takes place, that compresses the spinal cord um, and leads to swelling and edema around the spinal cord itself. And so now our both both uh, sensory and motor nerves are not able to send their signals out. And of course, that then leads to major patient dysfunction, meaning that we have paresis and or paralysis, which obviously has a major impact in quality of life from an owner perspective, but of course, also for the patient. Um, and in fact, there was a study published in JAVMA 2008, uh, where they surveyed owners. And what they care more, more about than anything else is whether their dog re 
gains ambulation. Um, you know, so regardless of the etiology, the perceived quality of life is higher if a dog regains ambulation um, than if they remain non-ambulatory. Um, so this is a disease that uh, we see very commonly. And of course, anything, any level of evidence that can improve their outcome is something I think worthwhile studying. So while I had this really great personal experience of using uh, the PMF device in these patients that either were recovering from a hemilaminectomy or we were pursuing conservative management for their disc herniation, um, I, I started to look in the literature and I was like, well, you know, we don't have any evidence to demonstrate that, that even though I have this anecdotal evidence that it ha helps, we don't have the literature. And so that is why I chose this disease to do a study on. Um, and first, I'm going to present to you the study that was published out of NC State, and then I'll present to you my research. So um, very nice, uh, nicely conducted study out of NC State College of Veterinary medicine. Um, it was a study published by Zidan, but led by Natasha Olgby. The, this was a prospective blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial. Um, they had 16 dogs. Uh, all of these dogs actually had, you know, they were in the worst category as far as prognosis. These dogs were all paraplegic, deep pain negative. Um, again, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial. They followed these dogs out from immediate post-op to six weeks post-operatively. They their um, outcome measures were measured, you know, immediate and then two weeks post-op and six weeks post-op. They looked at a gait score. Um, they also looked at mechanical um, stimulation threshold. So basically they induced pain with a machine that elicited a mechanical threshold for them to evaluate uh, pain response, as well as their proprioceptive responses. They also um, measured this um, spinal cord inflammatory biomarker, which I honestly was not familiar with uh, prior to reading the study, but it's a um, glial uh, fibular acidic protein that they measured, which is a biomarker for spinal cord injury. Um, and um, there, we're also looking at proprioceptive placing. So the study found significant improvements um, in proprioceptive placing at six weeks postoperative, in addition to significantly decreased um, GFAP, so that gliofibrillary acidic protein was significantly decreased in the PMF group um, at the two weeks postoperative. Um, so it's really nicely conducted study that gives us some objective evidence that we can improve recovery in this worse population Base. So these are your dogs that we frequently tell them, you know, you know, they're unlikely to even walk again. Um, we are seeing that they're um, improving in their proprioception and this um, biomarker is reduced, which would lead us to believe that the healing of these damaged nerves is going to improve um, with the PMF therapy. This was published in the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2018 um, by Zidane. Um, so moving on to the study that we conducted here at the Animal Medical Center, um, this was, again, a prospective, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial. Uh, it was a much larger clinical trial than what was done out of NC State, so I enrolled 60 dogs into my study. Um, 53 of those dogs completed the study because we had dropouts for various reasons. Um, they were randomized to receive either the targeted PMF therapy or a sham control device. They looked absolutely the same. It was actually really cool. Um, so you turn on, you press the button, the little green light comes on and they look and feel exactly the same. But one device, the sham device, emitted no electromagnetic field therapy uh, and the targeted device did. And nobody knew that we were all blinded. All investigators, nurses, uh, all of the clinicians that were involved in the study, the owners were blinded. So it was um, almost what you can call a triple blinded study because nobody knew which was the, the real device versus the sham. Um, and our objectives were really to, to evaluate the effect of the targeted PMF on postoperative pain management, wound healing, and then most importantly, functional outcome measures in dogs following hemilaminectomy. Um, so just so you know, declarations, I um, was not an employee or a 
uh, consultant for a CC. They also did not provide any funding for the study outside of providing the devices. So a CC provided both the sham and therapeutic PMF loops, but there was otherwise no sponsorship. And we did that purposely to avoid bias. Um, the study was conducted here at the Animal Medical Center. I was the primary investigator and then our neurologist um, also participated as well as a board certified uh, surgeon and our statistician. Those were all the authors. This paper was published last year in the Journal of the American Animal Hospital Association, and you have the reference there. If you'd like a copy, just let us know. We're happy to send you a full copy. So um, this is what it looked like. Uh, the device at that time uh, was white, as you see here, and we applied the device. So as these patients were coming out post-operative, they were actually still in the recovery room, we immediately uh, placed the device on them and we either uh, would vet wrap it on them so it would stay in place or we would actually Leilani, we seem to have lost your voice. Can you uh -huh. guys hear me? Looks like we got disconnect. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you again. Oh, okay, per perfect. All right, so uh, moving on then. Um, the device that we used was the Assisi device. This is a portable battery operated device. It does have, uh, this is the FDA clear device with the 27.12 megahertz. Hey, would you be uh, able to share your screen again and unshared? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yep, give me one second. technical difficulties. There you go. You're okay. back. Okay, good. Perfect. Everybody see you okay? Perfect, and we hear you perfectly. Excellent. So the device that we used was the Assisi device with the, remember I was talking to you about the difference between various pulse duration, frequency, the antenna, and the geometry of the, of the delivery is really important. Um, and we used to think actually that the ACC loop um, delivered almost like a football shaped emission that was about two thirds the diameter of the aperture, but we now know it's actually much greater than that. It actually goes out approximately 25 centimeters on either side of the aperture. So that's about um, 10 inches, uh, both cranially and caudally. Um, now it doesn't go up and down, so it just goes through the aperture, you know, in a cranial and caudal direction. So you can either lay it on top of the incision, or if you have a small dog like a dachshund, you can actually loop their entire body, and it will go cranially and caudally to get the entire area. Um, so this is the feel. This is the device that we used. Um, the What's really cool about this therapy is that it penetrates through both hard and soft tissue wraps and bandages. So if you have a patient that is bandaged, uh, it's not a problem. Uh, if you have a catheter on a limb or something like that, you can still use it. It's not a problem. The only thing that will interfere is any metal. Um, and it's not that it won't work at all, but it will interfere with the signal. And it is contraindicated if you have a pacemaker or a patient with an arrhythmia or something like that. Okay. Um, our Inclusion criteria was dogs ranging from two to 10 years of age. Uh, we did have a weight range as well. Um, they had to have no motor activity. So that means that all of these dogs um, were paraplegic essentially. So they had no motor activity and they could or could not have deep pain. So we did not use that as an exclusion. A lot of these uh, post-operative hemilaminectomy studies exclude the deep pain negative dogs because they do have a much poorer prognosis. Um, but we decided to include everybody because we wanted to see See, you know, whether PMF made a difference in their outcome. Um, we did exclude patients that had prior episodes of intervertebral disc disease. If there were unrelated lesions on an MRI, uh, like say like hemorrhage or something like that, unrelated to the disc lesion, we excluded them. And also if there was any significant concurrent disease, for example, if they had degenerative myelopathy, uh, chronic kidney disease, neoplasia, severe pyoderma, or severe osteoarthritis, really any OA that we 
knew of, we tried to exclude all of those patients. Um, we also excluded patients that had a seizure history um, just because we didn't want to manage uh, that situation with recovery from the hemilaminectomy, but that is actually not a contraindication for PMF. So you can use it with seizure patients, um, but we just did not include those in our study. Um, but you would not want to use the PMF if your patient has an active arrhythmia, particularly if they have a pacemaker. Um, our procedure uh, was very standardized as far as the pain management protocols and postoperative care. Um, they had icing for the first six hours of the incision. They had their bladder expressed. Um, we did passive range of motion for them. Um, all evaluators were blinded, as I said. We had board certified neurologists or their resident uh, performing neurologic scores on them twice daily. Um, it was um, a scale of zero to five, where um, zero is a normal patient and five means that they're paraplegic B-pain negative. Um, and we also did wound scores that were all done by a blinded board certified surgeon. And I'll explain to you, we did the visual analog score and then we also did a wound evaluation score and all evaluations were done immediate post-op, day 14 and day 42, which is six weeks post-op. Um, so the wound evaluation scale, most people don't know what that is, but this is a validated scale uh, where we're really looking at very specific things um, of the incision itself. Are there any step off borders, contour irregularity, how, how wide is the scar itself, um, you know, how inflamed it is, the redness of it. Um, and anyway, the scoring um, goes anywhere from zero to six. Um, and the lower the score, um, I'm sorry, the higher the score. So six out of six um, is the most optimal wounds uh, healing. And the VAST score uh, was out of zero to 100, uh, where 100 is the best looking incision. Um, and, um, you know, the lower the score is worse. Um, we also did a home um, evaluation questionnaire where owners had to fill it out twice daily. Um, they actually had to note the time and the date that they administered the treatment. They had to pain score their dog um, and we reviewed that with them. They actually went home with the, it was the Colorado State University pain scale that we used. We educated them on how to use that. Um, so they assigned a pain score twice daily. Then they let us know if their dog was able to stand independently, if they could wag their tail, if they could urinate on their own, if they could walk, and that was at least six steps or more independently. Um, and then they also had to log the pain medications that they gave. So while the patients were in the hospital, they had a standardized pain management protocol. So they received pain medications regardless, like everybody received their pain medication the same. But as soon as they were discharged, the owners had the option of whether they administered pain medication. Uh, in our results, what we found was that the neurologic scores improved in both of the groups, whether they were in the sham or the PMF. Although we did have improved scores in the PMF group, that was not statistically significant. Uh, we did a linear regression, um, and we found that at the six-week mark, um, so patients who received the PMF device compared to the sham device, it essentially was significant, and that the, the p-value was 0.051. Um, so our reviewers were quite harsh um, in that they said because it was 0.001 off of the 0.05 line of significance, they did not call that significant. But as you and I know, um, and actually all statisticians agree that um, the difference between 0.05 five and 0.051 is essentially nothing. Um, so in my mind, um, with the linear regression, there was a, a statistical difference between the PMF group at the six week mark neurologically. Um, and then also if you look at, so the in the initial seven days post-operative, 16 of the dogs regained the ability to voluntarily walk. Um, and the mean time to ambulation in the PMF group was three days uh, compared to the sham group being six days. Um, that p-value was 0.08, so that is not statistically significant. Um, and there's, here's just two ways to look at those neurologic scores. I like to look at it visually um, in both ways. Uh, if you look at the whisker plot over here, um, this line across the middle is the median, and then the upper bar and the lower bar is the inter interquartile range. So the lower bar is 25% of the population, the upper bar is 75%, and then the lines up and above is the entire population, and then these dots 
that are the outliers. So if you can see here going from day zero, so that's immediate post-op, to day 14, two weeks post-op, and six weeks post-op, you can see that their neurologic score improves in all of them. So again, remember five is if they were paraplegic deep pain negative, zero is that they're completely normal. Um, three is when they've lost motor, but they still have pain perception. And then two, now they're actually you know, voluntarily walking. Um, and so you can see all of our groups improve significantly, uh, but you can see you know, visually that the PMF group was slightly better both at the two week mark and the six week mark. Um, and then in this other plot that you can see here, the gray bars basically gives you the, your median. Um, and you can see here, um, again, uh, when we look at the days, so 42 uh, was the six week mark and then 14 you can look at here was the two week mark. So that's the arrows looks at where we looked at our outcome measures. And again, you can see the overall trend on the PMF group was a greater improvement compared to the sham. You can see that unfortunately, um, a couple of the patients that were in the PMF group were outliers. So they were way out. So we had one patient that was, you know, started off better and then actually got worse. And this was actually um, a, a surgical complication um, and then vice versa, other patients that started off not great and like went to completely normal. So those outliers then affect your statistics, of course. Um, and so in summary, what we found was that the wound scores improved um, significantly at six weeks, both in the VAS scores and the wound evaluation scores. Um, so the PMF group did better. Uh, we found no statistical difference in the overall pain scores, neurologic scores, or ability to regain functional tasks, including the ability to urinate independently, stand and walk independently. Um, however, the PMF device, which was the ACC loop, um, everybody reported that it was easy to use. This was both by clinicians and owners uh, with no uh, significant side effects noted. Um, and then here's the real, I think, biggest takeaway from our study is that when these patients went home, remember that owner questionnaire, they had the option of whether they gave pain medication or not. And there was a significantly higher number of owner administered pain medications in the group that had the therapeutic device compared to the sham device. And in fact, it was uh, coding in particular was administered 1.8 times more frequently in the sham group than in the group that received the PMF. So essentially the group that received the PMF, um, they administered the code um, then gabapentin was the other drug, approximately 50% less than the group that did not receive PMF. So remember, that's very similar to the research that we had on the human side with the 50% decrease in narcotic use. Um, so, you know, that's really a big, big takeaway. It was the level of improvement in pain management. Um, so key points here, just to wrap things up as far as the benefits of PMF, uh, we have evidence um, to increase uh, both wound healing and bone healing. Uh, we have significant decreases in soft tissue swelling, edema, and inflammation, and that is in fact what the FDA labeling is for. Uh, we also have uh, impactful differences in improving pain management non-pharmacologically. In our study, Study, uh, conducted here out of the Animal Medical Center, uh, again with 53 dogs. So it's a large scale double blind placebo controlled clinical trial. We demonstrated improved wound scoring at six weeks and approximately a decrease in pain medication administration by the owners by 50% after the patients were discharged. Um, and again, a really great opportunity to treat pain non pharmacologically. Um, and just again, to go along with our, those patients that I showed in the beginning, um, this dog that was had no motor activity, um, here she is after she received a series of PMF treatments, uh, both in clinic and at home, she regained full ambulation. Um, so that's really what we care about is an improved recovery. Uh, with that, I just wanted to thank our sponsor, Assisi.